Hi, the Black Talk Media Project would like to invite you to become a member of the BTR Community subscription-based social media platform. BTR Community is a platform that was set up for the listening audience of Black Talk Radio Network, the number one independent black radio network online. For just $24 per year, your subscription gives you access to an interactive space to share information with like-minded people with your privacy guaranteed. Your subscription will go a long way to help us maintain and improve our current media platforms. It will also help provide a budget so that we can begin the task of establishing localized media centers and radio stations across the United States. The best way to show your support and appreciation for what we do here at Black Talk Radio is to subscribe. Help us to help you be informed. Join btrcommunity.com today. The views and opinions expressed by callers, guests, and hosts do not necessarily reflect those of the Black Talk Radio Network and Black Talk Media Project. Black Talk Radio is new black media for the new millennium. Radio broadcast by Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, you are here tonight with my brother, Brother Rise, and myself, Jenna Kepra. Uh, brother Rise, are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can. Yes, sir. We can. Today is April the 17th, Tuesday. And we have a live show for you tonight. We will get into several, several different uh, topics. Uh, one of the topics that I wanted to get into was the Constitution. Uh, are we in default? What do I mean by that? When we say that we're in default, that means that we are in receivership and we have went bankrupt. Uh, we will discuss some of these topics because it's a it's a very difficult topic to discuss, especially when you see the United States still operating the way it does. But bef- also, are you wearing a mask? Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't normally don't think of it in this particular manner but are you the same person that you are when you're at home when you're at work these are all of the things that we would discuss along with what's in the news so before we get into any of those topics I would give my brother Rise open the door for you my brother and let the people know some of the topics that we will be discussing tonight as far as what's in the news uh yes, to get into the news we'll be dealing with oh, there's actually a few things there. Um uh one to one has to do with the uh D C police department. I found this to be very interesting. Uh dealing with them, uh including in their training multiple trips to the African American History Museum. Um, I don't know what they think they're gonna solve by doing that, but that's a part of their training now. Um, and it's, it, they claim it's in order for them to get a historical understanding of the police department's relationship to the black community. Um, but the police know their relationship. It, you know, I, I just, well, we'll get into that, but that's one of them. Um, the other one is uh, interesting, too, with the Starbucks situation that happened in Philly um, with the, the two young men being arrested for waiting while black. Um, they closed 8,000 stores in the U.S. for an afternoon of 
basically racial sensitivity training. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't know what they think they're going to solve by doing that in a system of white supremacy, but I think it's just a codified way of making the public think that they're trying to do something about their codified racism and how they practice it. I just think they want to be more refined about it, and they're just trying to fool the public into uh, thinking that they're doing something substantial to uh, work against the problem. So we'll see about that. Um, there's a few. There's quite a few. We'll be talking or dealing with, uh, well, I don't know if we'll get into this one, but it has to do with uh, 5G um, and some uh, a, a video I came across in reference to that and the weaponizing of 5G. And um, there's some other stuff that, that uh, Jenna and I have been talking about over the last week or so uh, dealing with that topic. So we'll definitely touch on that. Um, also, uh, some stuff to do with cloning. And I want to touch on that uh, that uh, cult of, of Moloch that uh, Brother Davis had brought up earlier this evening because uh, it's something that I've talked about before. And that also had, ties into the mask situation because masks, aren't always things that are worn by individuals. It's also something that's done culturally. When people uh, commandeer other people's culture, that's one of the things they do is they mask it. So we're going to get into uh, this cult of Moloch and how it relates to uh, ancient African history and the commandeering and disrespect of our, one of our ancestors. So, uh, yeah, so that's some of the stuff we'll be getting into this evening. Uh, Brother Scotty, real quick, can you give us the uh, the Uber conference address real quick? Because uh, you know, this is our first time doing it this way. I want to be able to have that uh, and say it correctly. Yes, it's uberconference dot com slash Black Talk Radio Network. Uberconference.com forward slash Black Talk Radio Network. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, yes, thank you. And with that being said, Brother Roz, if you would, uh, let's jump right on into this. Uh, first okay. things first, uh, let's deal, before we get to all of the training, which is what the police always say after they told us that they feared for their lives. Uh, I would like to get into the first one with this this whole Starbucks thing. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people that, that's hollering that, you know, they don't understand. You know, it's two sides to every coin when it's actually really three. It's what happened what one person said and what the other person said. Right. When it happened, I told you that I I expected for this to happen. You know, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't nothing. It wasn't nothing new. Uh, I wasn't shocked. And then, by the way, the brothers was dressed. Not saying that that justified it, but we know that certain people. They do things like this, and I felt like it was a, a perfect, a perfect chance for these suspected racists to practice on these two brothers, because these two brothers was was pretty large, especially uh, compared to some of the people that was in there. Uh, they was not dressed in what you would call professional manner, mm -hmm. and I know some people hear me say this and it's like how can you a melanated brother a black brother an aboriginal whatever title you would like to give yourself how could you say this the fact of the matter is is that we have been getting practiced on for a long time and when we talk about more confused people they themselves know how we get treated so when you go certain places you expect certain things These are, this is the law of the jungle you know and we live 
in a jungle. And what I mean is, uh, you yourself, Brother Rise, you know, uh, New York is called the concrete jungle, is it not? Absolutely. And we know when we run into these other predators, no matter if you are a predator or you are prey, you know it's certain predators that you keep your distance from, depending on the person that you are. Mm -hmm. These people, these two brothers went into a, a, an establishment that has a known history of mistreating us. They and run I'm into enemy saying, territory. It, exactly. Well, that that could be anything, but but you are correct. Oh yeah, like, anywhere in this country is enemy territory until we instate a, 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 a system of justice. But in that sense, it's an acute walk into enemy territory because of that history. That's the thing. Like we don't pay attention. A lot of us don't pay attention to the history of some of these places. We think we can go to these places like the colonizer does. And we're going to be treated the same because we're American. And when I say American, I mean in the context of white supremacy. So I think that is the first uh, codified error, if I may point that out. It's not a, 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 a judgment, but an assessment. Because that, like you said, I, I, I would never be caught dead or alive in a Starbucks. That's just, I just don't mess with Starbucks. I, I will do without their coffee. I don't need coffee. It's not something I'm into. But on, even if I did, I would never be in there. That's just not something I, I would do. And it's based on just what you said. I don't support businesses that practice white supremacy. I just they can't do it. And that would be one of them at the top of the list. So to me, that was the first mistake. And then you're in a place surrounded by colonizers. You weren't in there. And it, I mean, granted, it's in Philly, but there's a lot of colonizers in Philly. There's a whole bunch. I, I, it's not too far from where I live. I, it, matter of fact, it's clo Philly's closer to me than New York, but I'm pretty much like almost in the center between two places, but Philly's actually physically closer. It takes me much less time to get there than it does to get to the city. And, yeah, that, that to me is a whole other thing. That's something that I've also talked about before, just not being in places where there's a lot of them surrounding yourself by them and and you know i've seen really bad things happen to more confused victims and they don't necessarily have to be black all they have to do is be non-white and you know depending on the circumstances and whether or not those uh, colonizers have been drinking you will you know they'll show you better than i can tell you so i think that that was the the, the, the major error and then once you deal with these these people um you know the other aspect of it is they themselves, and, and, you know, Gus talks about this on the cows, think of every white person as an authority figure, like a police officer. And they're, they're very capable of calling for backup. They do that all the time. So you are surrounded by the enemy, and then on top of that, they call backup on you. So now you have the other extension of the system of white supremacy, the law enforcement, which I call policy overseers. We call them police, but they're policy overseers. The policies that they oversee is the system of white supremacy. So the whole thing in a nutshell is now they, they, they call for backup on you, and the, this type of backup, you can't escape. Well, and they decided you know to practice on you too. Go ahead. You brought up a, a, a very interesting point, these policy overseers, mm -hmm. meaning that the policy in place is the rule of that particular area. We mm -hmm. can say the land, but we're going to seclude it to that area. Mm -hmm. Well, what we do know is that when this happens, we go certain places, and this could be a bookstore, it could be to the jewelry store, it could be anywhere. When we go in there, and all of us know this, whether you would like to admit it on air, me, myself, I like to give out certain references to my personal life to make it personal about the situations that we're talking about. And in this particular point, every time I go somewhere when there is an extremely large number of white people, I don't get nervous, but my flight of fight kicks in. I decide if I want to actually stay in that area 
or I decide if I want to go ahead and go ahead. My children, my family, they may they may decide that they want to do this, that, or the other. I don't do it very often because we don't go out to eat. Uh, I love to barbecue. You know, I'm still a meat eater myself, so I, I still love to fix steaks, chicken, fish, uh, lamb. If we feeling a little bit, uh, you know, if, if we feeling a little bit awkward. I, I still fix all of these things myself. So when I go somewhere, I normally feel like they're not treating me as if I would be treated at home anyway. But mm-hmm. sometimes you get this little small tingling in your back that lets you know that, you know what, you probably don't need to be here today. And when these when these two brothers went in and they asked for the key to the restroom, and they told them that they couldn't use it unless they was going to patronize that business, that's probably when they should have just been like, you know what, we're just going to call our old buddy, and we'll tell him we'll either meet him when he get here or we need to go somewhere else. They didn't do that. Mm-hmm. They, were very res- they were very respectful. Uh, uh, and, and we have a question over here in the uh, comment section, brother Chris. They was there because these two brothers were uh, they were real estate agents, and they were there for a business meeting with one of their uh, non-black colleagues. That, that's why they were there at the Starbucks. But when when the lady, when the Batista, if I'm saying that correctly, I know Brother Rob said that my barista that I was saying it wrong. Barista. <laughs> yeah. When they was there with the barista, when she asked them that particular question, that would have notified me that we was gonna have a little bit of issue. Now me myself, uh, fiery attitude and what have you. I probably would have said something to the uh, barista. Mm-hmm. Just just me being me and knowing myself. But that's not necessarily the best thing, but I'm not saying that that's the worst thing either because once you lay your authority down, it makes people make a choice. You either have a choice to uh, do something extra or you decide to treat them like the rest of the human beings that were there. And I know a lot of people that's going to be listening was like the rest of those people were not human beings, but, you know, that's your opinion. Uh, <laughs> Uh-oh. And, and that, that's the case. But you will be treated differently once you made your personal authority be known. But now they you know were respectful. Uh, go ahead, brother. You know, and I'm sorry for interjecting. You made me think of something, too, because we've talked about this on the cow numerous times. Um, Gus had interviewed uh, Norm Stamper, who wrote the book Breaking Rank, and he was a um, police chief on the West Coast for like 20-something years. And the main thing that he made emphatically clear in his book and just in everyday life, because he's talked to officers across the country, is that the taller and bigger you are, and the darker your skin, the more terrifying you are to a cop and the more likely they will shoot you. And that I would just translate that because, like I said, all white folks are many police officers. So I would just say that if they're intimidated by you, they're more likely to shoot you or to do something to you um, because there's nothing more dangerous than a scared white person. You know, and, and that's just, just common sense. I'm a darker-skinned male. And I'm big. And I've even been in situations when I was younger making music where we've gotten into altercations with the NYPD in New York. And my partner was shorter than me. And he, you know, he had a kind of Napoleon complex. So he would get real mouthy. And I remember one time he went off on him in um, Uptown. And they were looking at me, though. He was doing all the talking. I didn't say a word. I was just looking at them. And I was asking them questions, and then after a while, I just got quiet because I knew you know, I just knew what it was all about. And my partner was going off, but they were physically moving towards me. And I actually had to, like, touch my partner and tell him, listen, you they need to chill out. They got to you first. Exactly. I said, you need to chill out. because, And it was about five of them. 
And I said, because everything you're saying, they're not looking at you. They're looking at me. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, you're bringing attention to both of us in a way, but they're going to handle me first because I'm bigger than you and I'm darker than you. He, he was Dominican, is Dominican. And, um, you know, and he, he, he chilled out. And then after they left, I had to break that down to him like, yo, you know, did you notice their body language? Did you notice they were inching closer to me? Because he was on my right side. I was on his left. So as he's talking, the, the police officers were physically closer to me because I was on his left. I was a little bit further in front of them. So as they moving, they moving in my direction. They ain't even moving in his direction. But he's the one right. speaking crazy. So I know exactly how that works, and I knew that from young. It, it just took me coming across a show like The Cow to start codifying my speech to coincide with my understanding of how I've been living for a long, long time. So Let me add un- to that, yo. Mm-hmm. Let me add to that. But before before I do, it seems that if we have a call up, yes, out, of the, uh, up out of uh, Milwaukee. I wonder if uh, this is live. Area code 414. Go ahead with your question and comment. Introduce yourself, if you would, please. Rod in Milwaukee. What's going on? Peace, Rod. Greetings, greetings. <clears throat> I wanted to just chime quick with uh, I'm a uh, heavy coffee drinker, and um, I frequent uh, Starbucks daily. Uh, in the Milwaukee area, uh, I go to what is considered the black Starbucks, but um, I do go to all of them uh, all across the United States. I've been from Texas, California, uh, wherever I go. Like, the first place I go is to a Starbucks. <clears throat> and the reason be uh, because their policy is that you ain't got to spend no money. And <clears throat> the reason uh, that this uh, racist suspect, uh, I'm not sure if she got transferred and or she uh, parted ways with the company. But the reason she got transferred. Okay, so the reason that she is not at that particular location anymore is because that the policy that she had in place um, is not actual Starbucks policy. That's just quote unquote hood shit. She was doing, excuse my language, that was just something that she was doing in that particular area to try and cut out the panhandle. But that was not actual national policy, and that's why you got the racist suspect coming out quote unquote trying to get in front of the thing, and that's why they quote unquote have racial. Uh, sensitivity training. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, let me uh, let me for that real quick. Hat. I got one more thing to add. Oh, go ahead, quick bro. Kid, bitch. Uh, the uh, black male Dontre Hamilton uh, that yeah. was killed here. He was outside of a Starbucks. And same situation. It was the racist suspect manager that called uh, the police. His brother was actually on the way to uh, pick him up. And, uh, wow. That's, that's all I wanted to ask. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. And we thank you for uh, for yeah. chiming in, brother. If you want to uh, jump back in at any time, you you know how to get back in here. Uh, it's good to hear from you, too. I hope you're doing you know, all right. And I want to uh-huh. I want to address uh, uh, I want to address Rob also. But uh, before I do that, yeah, I think we got to address uh, that. <laughs> I see, brother, brother Scotty had a few questions, but let me address brother Rob first. Uh, mm-hmm. No, no, you are exactly right. That's not a policy that's written on paper. It's codified. Repeat. That's not a policy written on paper. The first thing that when this first happened, I called Rob. And I was uh, listening to a lot of people speaking about the racist activity within the Starbucks. On the uh, on the video that the young white woman had shared, they had other white people saying, "I can't believe this. They never treated us like that." And I was telling uh, Roz, I was like, "Yo." we have to address this individual first 
not just not just the individual. We also have to address the company because they have had uh, racist tactics by their employees that they have not addressed before now. Mm -hmm. But when I called them, I said, we have to address this individual first because I'm a person that does not believe in every white person is racist. Now, before anybody clown me for that, let me clarify. If I'm walking down the street, it's the same thing I'm going to give that white person, male or female, that I'm going to give a black person, male or female, when they disrespect me. If you're going to do something to me, and then you thinking that you're going to be able to make it to your car or to your home to get something that can actually hurt me, you have to make it there first. Whether it's your cell phone, a fork, a knife, a sword, a gun, you got to make it there first. And what makes you think, coming from where I come from, that you're going to make it to that reference point? I'm going to handle you right then and there. Now, I'm a young dude. I'm 35 years, excuse me. I'm giving myself a year. I'm 36. I'm 36 years old. I grew up in a time to where wherever you had an issue, you handled it right then and there. That's not saying that it's good. It's not saying that it's bad. I have a lot of bad circumstances for acting like that, but I'm also still here because I reacted in that manner. What happens is is that this woman, like you said, Rob, she took it upon herself. But she wouldn't have done that if she didn't have the blessing from the people that's in charge of her beforehand that let mm -hmm. that they may not have said nothing, but they gave her that inclination that it was okay to do that. What happened is they transferred her because of the way that it was handled. Now, when all of this protest, this social media, and then you always got to remember, you got President Orange, I mean, President Trump in the background <laughs> that has a, a big shadow which everybody is throwing up racism. Sometimes when racism is not even an issue, because, you know, sometimes we do echo food. I mean, I'm not going to point out no uh, particular circumstances right now, but sometimes we do. But people have been, since he got in, people have been throwing it up to where, uh, what's the word? It's kind of like they when they holler, you're using a race card. Well, if I got the card, then what happened to the other? What happened to all of the other cards in the deck? And so they throw this out, and sometimes it's not even us. It's them that's throwing that out there, and it kind of waters it down. So I believe this is what's going on right now. And what I mean is, is that, yeah, these brothers, they could have just left up out of that store, truth be told. When them folks told them and showed them they didn't want them there, they could have dipped. They could have. Most people would have. They decided they wanted to do something other. And we are lucky that we're not discussing these two brothers getting shot mm -hmm. in the Starbucks because they didn't leave when the when they was getting terrorized by somebody. I mean, think about if the police hadn't even came. A whole, something a whole lot worse could have happened. We don't know what this this uh, young white lady who was serving the coffee has been doing with her personal body. She could have spit in that coffee. You know what I'm saying? All kind of foolishness. You know what I'm saying? And then they would have drunk it and then walked up out of there with some type of disease. I mean, all of these things have to go across our mind when people act a certain way towards us. Even when they're not acting a particular way, but when they come out with with some with some straight up derogatory uh means, you have to take all of that into consideration. Remember, 
these brothers couldn't have done nothing but drunk that coffee and went home and destroyed their families on some genetic stuff. And she didn't have to call the police, get them beat up, uh, arrested, or none of that, and destroy their whole life. So we're actually lucky in this particular instance. And I'm going to get right back to you, uh, Scotty, but let's, Brother Rob, go ahead. I, I see you have a rebuttal. What's on your mind, brother? I just want to ask a question um, because, <laughs> like, I'm, like you said, the brothers, they could have did something different, and um, I would have reacted the same way. Like, I wouldn't have left. So my question is, um, and it's uh, related to workplace racism, knowing mm-hmm. policy teacher, right? So if in that situation, um, let's say, and this is hypothetical, let's say that they knew poly, policy and procedure for the national policy. If they would have responded with a question and asked, is this the policy for all Starbucks, would that had have been, with asking that question, would that would have been correct or incorrect? In your opinion? That, that would have been correct. That would have been correct. But that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have stopped me uh, from leaving. Uh, and the reason, let me, the reason I say that I would leave, uh, I see that you're you're up in Milwaukee. I've been to Milwaukee briefly, just brushing through. I don't know how y'all do things there. I know down here in Tennessee, uh, <laughs> they get real, they get very, very ratchet with the things that they do. Uh, about a year or so ago, a woman got arrested for uh, for taking juices from inside of her body and putting it on somebody's hamburger. So with me knowing these type of things, knowing the devious things that people do, initial, uh, what, what's, what's the term? It's uh, first impressions. Mm-hmm. First impressions are the most important. When somebody gives, when somebody tells you who they are, and we talked about this uh, last night, you let you believe them. You believe them when when people tell you who they are, you believe them. And I understand your stance as far as not wanting to leave because th- these brothers was actually finna purchase something; they were just waiting on somebody. But when somebody wants to do something to you just because you do not give them the opportunity to do that to you. You just don't do it. Because at that particular point, you're asking for it. Now, and like I said, I understand you saying the way that she was treating them or what have you, you would you would want to stay anyway. But that's kind of out of spite. You remember, I don't know if you're like me. I have five children. I have other responsibilities. That, that cup of coffee and that meeting could be held somewhere else. Preferably not up under some uh, racist suspect, which we know now is just a flat out racist. So when you run into these people, you recognize who they are and you act accordingly. If you already know that they are racist, why sit up under them? Does that make sense to you, brother? Exactly right. Uh, I'm just listening. Uh, you can mute me, and I'll uh, I'll chime back in. Once you uh, get Scotty. Uh. All right. No no worries. No worries. You wanted to uh, get in. You wanted to get into that. Or you wanted to get into Scotty question because I think Scotty's question was uh yeah because we already yeah because we're already at nine thirty and I want to get to some of these other articles too. So yeah, I think we should address address um what Scotty was talking about. I think this there was just this was a very profound discussion. Um and I, I and I think everybody had pretty salient points as far as um their position on things. And I think your last point made perfect sense. You know, I'm a little older so I just had more than enough experience with them to know who they are and I'm a person who is no nonsense when it comes to them. Um and and that's just my natural state of being. I just don't tolerate nonsense from them. So, and even in that instance, I know 
that I have to think ahead because I'm considered the most <laughs> dangerous living entity within the borders of this uh, corporation. You know, I'm black, I'm male, and um, I'm I'm big. You know, I'm six foot. Well, I mean, you <laughs> gotta add the fact that you know something too. That's that's never mm-hmm. a good thing unless you're making somebody else some money. That's that's definitely not what they want to deal with. Yeah, you always got to think ahead with them because they always try to outthink you. And the idea is that when they when they have somehow sensed that you are one of those black people who believe in the idea of America, like Neely Fuller so put it so eloquently put it, America as it's presented to the world is a great idea, and that's all it is, you know. But there's a lot of black people who believe that stuff, and they can pick you out. Like you know, Jeffrey Dahmer talked about it. Um, uh, what's his name? Charles Manson talked about it. These were predators, and they and and Jeffrey Dahmer specifically knew. He said, "I knew who I could get to my house, so I could drug them, rape them, chop them up, and then eat them." He had a well, predatory goes, instinct, and that just goes, goes for all of them. The, that goes to the uh, to the young white the the young white guy who was up there uh, chopping people up in uh, New York. You know, like you say, he was stalking a few mm-hmm. other people. They recognized him behind him. So he leaned back off for them and went for the homeless guy who just didn't have no worry in the world. You know, he had just got him yeah. a job and he was moving forward. But let's, uh, let's, answer, let's, answer let's go question. ahead on with uh, Brother Scotty's question. And what his question was, is are white people really afraid of you? Or is it that, or is that the excuse they use to justify their inclination for racist behavior? I don't believe for this a second violent. these white people are afraid of us there is just no reason for them to be. And then I he agree. went on to say that uh, if we had a history of lynching them, you, uh, bleh, I can't even speak. Mutilating. Mutilating. Excuse me. My apologies. Mutilating okay. them and enslaving them. If black cops were shooting down white people like they shoot us down, then yeah, they should be afraid of us but there is nothing that we are doing to them as a group to justify the mythical white fear. And you are exactly right, Scotty. Mm-hmm. But, and, and there is a but, there's always a but. When you, uh, and excuse me, Scotty calls them slave catchers. I, I, I always have to uh, bring that in. And the reason he calls them slave catchers is because of the 13th Amendment slavery has never ended yep. so yes they are definitely slave catchers but I respectfully disagree as far as them not being afraid I ran into a I ran into a, a huge white dude now mind you I'm I'm five eleven and a half and I may be adding an inch and a half <laughs> maybe maybe not I don't know you know, I might be adding that, I might not. But and I'm I'm a I'm a hundred and eighty seven pounds soaking wet. And I ran into this this white dude, uh he had his spider web tattoos and, and me being the person that I am, uh I've talked to a lot of uh racist gang bangers because I'm I'm a small engine mechanic as well as a, a diesel mechanic. So I've worked in close quarters with these people. And uh, the work that I have done, they wanted me to do work on people that they know and people that trust them. So they entrusted me, their vehicles and what have you, vehicles, uh, lawnmowers and things of that nature. So from time to time, I get to ask them questions freely. And they be so appreciative that they answer them honestly. So I know what those tattoos mean why you get these particular tattoos. So this guy has a spider web with with two uh, skulls on the inside, you know, and and those uh, spider web tattoos, for those of you who don't know, they mean that you either murdered someone or you got caught for attempted murder. And more times than not, you get those for the ones that that really earned those tattoos. They got them while they was in jail. So I ran into this uh this white guy. He's about six two, so he kind of sort of looked down on me when we speaking, you know, just because of the natural height difference. Uh, 
This guy's about 250 or what have you, and I have a bad problem with asking questions. When he busts up in there, I know what the tattoo means. I want to know if he's going to be honest with me when, he, when I ask him about the tattoos. So I asked him about the tattoos, and he looked at me kind of funny, and I was like, you know what? Don't even worry about it. You got your daughter right there with you. I know what the tattoos mean, so if you don't want to stay that in front of your daughter, I understand. He take his daughter to his vehicle, and he comes back in. He want to know what my question is. So I asked him about the tattoos, and he tell me about the tattoos, and then I tell him what I know the tattoos to mean and who they had to do something to to get those tattoos. And this dude whole face just turned just pale, white paper pale. Hmm. I'm not saying that he was afraid of me, but the fact that I knew that scared him. Because most people that he run across, black and white, don't know what none of that stuff means. So when I brought that up, he just got very, very flushed. Like all of the blood in the whole top part of his body just stopped flowing. <laughs> you know, so so we run into these people, uh, Scotty, and, and, and I do agree as far as them they don't have a reason to be, but it's always what you say. The propaganda that we are uh, that we are pu that's pushed upon us, I should say, the propaganda that's pushed upon us puts a particular light on us to where we are ostracized to a certain point. And I know you have a question, Brother Scotty. Go ahead. Your mic is open. Uh, greetings, fellas, and uh, greetings to mm -hmm. the listeners. Um, I'm talking about in the context of whenever we hear these cops say, I fear for my life, okay? Oh, right. You shot a yeah. black woman armed with a screwdriver or a little small steak knife. You shoot her in the head. I fear for my life. You're a big old strapping male. You ain't afraid. That you wasn't afraid of that black woman. When we think about it in the historical context, they have always outnumbered us, and they know they got a mob behind them, so they have no logical reason to fear you. They, I believe that that is an excuse used to justify. Now, I'm not talking about individual white people. Mm -hmm. Cowards come in all shape, shapes and sizes and colors and what have you, so you have your cowards out, out there, but I'm saying on, on a group level, what have we done to threaten their existence? We haven't done anything to threaten it. We don't have an army. We don't have an organized militia. We are not as heavily armed as they are. And, you know, we we just are not. In, we don't have a history of terrorism against their community. So I just think that, you know, this whole notion of were well, they mistreating you because they afraid of you. No, that's what they tell us to justify their murders, and that's what they always say. That's air, that's the go-to line from a cop. Now, you the one with the training. you probably been in the military as well. You the one with the weapon. You the one with the authority of the state behind you. And you see, you ain't never, it's very rare that you're going to be prosecuted if you straight up murder somebody. So I, I'm just not buying into they afraid of us. I think they do. I think I think white people who are evil just do us in their nature. I I I agree with that completely. Um, because I I wrote to you. I don't think they 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 are scared of us. It's only in the context of of fear of genetic annihilation. I definitely agree with Dr. Wilson on that. But in the context that you're speaking of, you're absolutely correct. I just think what it is is a codification of the justification of black death because this system is all about black death in some form or another when you're incarcerated you are essentially deceased to the living world you know you go in you know i knew people that went in in the 80s and didn't get out until the early 2000s and the world had changed so much they were dead to the world outside of watching tv and you know making phone calls and talking to relatives they really had no concept 
of what the real world looked like until they came home. And when it came home, when they came home, it wasn't home. By that time, New York was already starting to be gentrified. So, you know, that's one form of death. Then the, uh, the other aspect of that form of death as well is the fact that they're locking up your genetic material during your reproductive years. By the time you get out of prison, if you, if you spent what we used to call basketball numbers in jail, by the time you get out, you elderly. You know, the last thing you're thinking about is bringing the child into the world, especially after what you done came out of. So there and again, if you are, let's say, a revolutionary, that genetic lineage is not going to be passed on unless you had children prior to getting those basketball numbers. You know, outside of that context, that genetic lineage is effectively nullified. Then you have, like Scotty said, that codified, oh, he scared me, so I put 48 bullets in him. You know, and that's just the codification of what I would call the black code. It's a codification of it is okay to kill black people. Legally, this is the context with which you have to have killed them every time. And that's the... That's, me, go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to uh, add on to what you're saying because that is absolutely true when, we, when we're talking about the, the system itself. You know... Uh, that's that's what this woman did. That that's what she did. She called for backup, and Rod said it. Uh, I didn't ever think of it like that, but he said it very effectively. Is that she was a police that called for backup. Uh, Recognize these two brothers wasn't doing anything wrong. They wasn't disturbing anything, but yet they had what was it like six officers that showed up. Let me ask you something. When have you, heard, when have you heard a black person making a citizen's arrest? Anytime I've heard of a citizen's arrest, it's white folks doing that. And they get the same treatment when the police come. They treat them with respect. They treat them with human dignity. And they thank them. Oh, thank you. Such great work. I, you're, got, you're... I got one, Ross. I got <laughs> uh -huh. one. Okay. I do got one. And, it, and his brother, this brother, he made a citizen's arrest, and he had his uh, carry permit, and he had his gun on the suspect, and you know what they did when they showed up? They shot him. They went in. Nah, they didn't shoot him. Oh, they, okay. they detained him, though. They oh, detained okay. him, and then they asked everybody who didn't have nothing to do with the situation about it before they released him to hear what he had to say about the suspect because the suspect was a white gentleman trying to break into his vehicle. So he held him at gunpoint and called the police, and they harassed him first. So that's, that's what you get. <laughs> when wow. we make a citizen's arrest, uh, but we do have uh, we got to get to the rest of these uh, these articles. But brother Rob, mm -hmm. go ahead, brother. Oh, I just wanted to chime in on the question presented, um, and my answer is a combination of both. Um, while I don't think that the officers um, in making the statement, you know, I fear for my life. While I don't. I don't think it's an actual physical fear. I think it's more of a genetic uh, fear that comes out um, as that type of uh, physical threat of fear. And I think it's something um, probably that they can't even help. Um, <clears throat> and you saying it's in there? Kind of, sort of. Like, because like we just keep hearing it so much you know what I'm saying like we just keep hearing it so much over and over and over and over and um, yeah that's all I got I think they can't okay. help it because it's a codified automatic response the system has allowed for them to respond that way to us since slavery you know for if so you leave a delectable negro they, they had one infamous story of a black male that was asked to fry some fish for his slave master on a boat during the middle of a, basically almost a hurricane type storm and he was expected to cook it out in the open he told the slave specifically to do that because he had a pattern of setting the slave up to mess up so he had justification of abusing him both sexually and uh, physically in front of all the other slaves he, this was his pattern and the guy, the brother tried to cook this fried fish and it was being ruined by the storm. He couldn't even keep the fire going. So he ended up poaching the fish. That was the best he could do with the weather and the circumstances and following his master's orders. So when he came back, 
he lit right into him. He made him get butt naked in front of everybody and, and then basically tore his flesh apart and enjoyed every minute of it. And that's basically what the Delectable Negro is about, is basically how some of these white men got more sustenance from brutalizing the black body to the point where they would not even eat food. There's stories of them, some of them getting off so much on just whipping a slave and what they would call seasoning them. So they would beat you till you're bloody and then take crushed up bricks, salt and pepper and rub it in your wound. Then um, another guy, after he beat him and he seasoned him, put salt in his wounds and pepper in his wounds, he ended up taking uh, bought, uh, 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 sizzling pig fat and pouring that on top of it. So he's burning them after he beat them. I mean, that's the stuff they, they do. So to me, I think it's a codified response that has been such the norm for them for well over 500 years that it's just auto, it's just an automatic response now where, like you said, they can't help it because it's just codified. This is how you treat black people. So it's like, hey, anything goes, it's cool. All I got to do is say I was scared, you know, and, and it even boils down to the, 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 the average citizen deputy, George Zimmerman. I was scared. Stand my ground. It's, it's, it's like we've watched them do this for so long, they learn from each other. You know, it's no different than when you see what, what they call the first signs of culture in the chimpanzee, when the adult chimp for the first time sticks a stick in the termite mound and pulls out 30 termites and he's tearing them up. And then one of the babies are watching him do that and they imitate. So you've had that happen for 500 plus years with white people. So it's just automatic. This is what you do to these people. Huh. You know, great analogy. Let me ask um, you this question. Mm -hmm. And it goes to you too, Brother Scotty. Uh, because what I have noticed, at least here in uh, Tennessee, in Chattanooga, is that the fears, the most feared of us, and what I mean by fears is the people who have been known to shoot and or kill people somehow get out of we, we, we're not even going to discuss that side of how they continuously get out of jail but that's a whole other topic of discussion because I know we got to go on to the other ones but I would really like to ask you and all of the listeners this particular question why is it that they always go to jail unharmed the people who will murder these uh, slave catchers without a second thought they always make it to jail but the 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 softer of us and, and I probably said that wrong but the softer men that come from us I should say they get gunned down with high authority why is that now I have my own uh, thoughts and ideas about that but I'm asking you two brothers right now for the moment. Okay, now just run that by me one more time so I can make sure I'm clear before I answer. Okay. Why is it that the the more bloody the bloodiest brothers that has bodies on their on their uh mm -hmm. on their record, they are known killers, they go to jail. And they could be in a firefight with the police. They make it to jail. But the softer of us, the ones who are trying to give up mm -hmm. and, and, and not taking no chances or, or anything, they get murdered uh, quickly. Why okay. is that? We talked about this off air, so I'm going to basically yeah. say what I said because I, I personally had experience with a police officer in the last year, um, within the last year. Uh, where I could have been on the news and one thing was that my whole because I, at the time I didn't know that this was a police officer I thought this was a white man following me and I was going to reckon with this white man for following me and I, I, I basically snuck the officer as he followed me um, through the train station I, I came out from a, from a hiding place he knew I was there but he wasn't expecting me to, to confront him so at the time, I didn't know he was an officer, so I was ready to, you know, like really put some work in on this dude. And yeah, I'm, the business. yeah, I'm six foot. He had to have been about maybe five, four. 
Um, so as I reached, because I was actually going to like grab him and shake him, and really my intention was to toss him in front of a train. If I if he didn't like really answer my question as to why he was following me, and I felt like my life was threatened, then that was my my whole thought process in that moment. And I kid you not, when I came from behind that pole and he saw the look on my face, he ain't reached for his gun. I had never seen the officer flash his badge so fast in my life. And when he did, my hands dropped to my side. And then I and then I asked him. I said, um, I said, well, what's the purpose of you approaching me right now? And um, he went into telling me why. And then we got through everything. He realized what he thought I had on me. I didn't, um, not knowing that what I did show him was really dangerous to his life. But he just thought it was a pen. Um, and I had other things on me too. But I know how to, you know, make sure that police don't search you because I know my rights. Um, and if he did, then it would have been tossed out of court. But ultimately, um, the, the situation called as such that with the aggression, the uh, aggressive approach I took, you would have, I thought that he would have shot me once I realized he was a cop. But he didn't reach for his gun. He reached for his badge. And once he did, the aggression just melted because I understood now it's time for me to get codified. I still understand because, you know, I've said it on the air before. If, if, if I ever encounter an officer and they give me the impression that they're going to take my life, the last thing I'm going to do is run, and the last thing I'm going to do is stand there and let them do it. So you're going to find me plastered somewhere on the news, and I'm not having it. That's just, and I told my family the same thing. That is just not my pedigree, and I ain't asking for that to happen. It's just That's just the way I'm built. And in that situation, they didn't do anything. Now, if you look at Larry Davis, they literally went to murder him after forcing him to sell drugs. Um, for a number of years during his young teen life, I believe starting at 13 was when the police first started um, taking him and his and his boys and and showing them how to sh sell drugs and teaching them to rob drug dealers and to shoot. So when they came to get him, he let them have it. it he hit six of them every time he let off a bullet. It hit its mark, and um, he led the New York Police Department on the longest manhunt in its state history, 19 days. They couldn't find him. He was in Brooklyn. He was in the Bronx. He was all over the place. And um, But he was in the city. He never left the city. And ultimately, when they did come to get him, he negotiated that he wanted to go into the hands of the FBI because he didn't trust the NYPD. And they allowed him to do that. Why? Because I believe, like I told you off air, if you show signs of that kind of aggression, where if they're going to take your life, you are ready, willing, and, and if you're able, you will take theirs, there's a different level of respect for people who have that approach. It doesn't mean that it works all the time. Sometimes people who are on it like that might catch a bullet. But for the most part, the ones who run are the ones who get shot. The ones who um, are the most intimidated to the point where the officer knows they can get away with something and you'll say, you'll hear the cop say oh I fear for my life and then all of a sudden somebody got camera footage and it's opposite to Ed Walter Scott if I remember correctly was a good example of that this brother was running from the cop and the cop said he felt threatened after I believe he tased him like twice or three times and then shot him in the back and it was only the camera footage that, that showed it for what it really was but again it's that acute fear you know Mm -hmm. Go ahead. We gotta we gotta go to this uh we gotta go to this short commercial break. After oh, we right. get back, you finish your thought, and then we are gonna get to Brother Scotty. Uh, you are listening to uh, Real Life the Radio Show, presented by Foundational Radio on Black Talk Radio Network. We'll be we'll be right back after this quick commercial break. You are tuned in to the Black Talk Radio Network for podcasts and live program scheduling. Visit us on the web at blacktalkradionetwork.com. Now the Wu-Tanga. Man, I love that part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Brother Scotty, go ahead. Yeah, to answer your oh. question, I can't answer your question because there's too many variables in that situation and it's not something that I've studied. All I can speak on is in, from personal experience. I have actually had cops pull guns on me in two instances, the first instance, I was a 12-year-old running around with a BB gun like it was a real gun, and 
one of the neighbors, and this is in a black neighborhood in Detroit, one of the neighbors oh. called the police and, and, and snitched on me. Thought I had a real gun. It wasn't a real gun. It was a BB gun. It was just tucked in my pants. So these cops pull up in an unmarked car. I recognize who they are, and they black cops too. And I go to run, and they jump out, and they say freeze, and I froze. Now, they had drawn their guns and everything, and, and the black cop told me that if I didn't stop, he was going to shoot me. This was back in the, this would be in 78, 78 or wow. 79. The last time I had a cop pull a gun on me was because of something stupid I did. I was in a car, in my car, uh, driving with no license, went through a license check, and so the cop was going to give me a ticket and, and tell me, I, you know, I'm going to have to leave my car. It's going to, you know, they're going to have somebody come tow it. So I'm knowing I'm going to jail because I knew I had a failure to appear bench warrant out on me. So I know I'm going to jail. So not thinking, I reach under my seat to get a bag of change because I kept my, you know, I kept a lot of loose change in, in one of those Crown Royal bags. And I'm reaching mm -hmm. for that. And he pulls out his gun and points it at my head and says, freeze. And I froze. And when I was in the back of that car, I apologized to him profusely. Because if I had got shot, it would have been my fault for reaching under the seat for some stupid change. Because I'm worried about somebody's going to steal my change. Okay. But he didn't shoot me. And this was a white cop. So I don't know anybody. In my lifetime, whether they, I never had a family member shot by cops, and I don't know anyone personally or anyone that has been shot by cops. That's just not something that happens in this area a lot. So, you know, that's all I can go off of is my personal interactions. Mm -hmm. I don't want to speculate about why certain people, I, it's too many variables. It depends on, yeah, it depends on the cop. It depends on whether or not they think they can get away with it. It depends on whether or not they're just serial killers, and that's why they chose that profession, and, and they just want to murder somebody. It just depends. It depends on the area you in, if there's witnesses. It just depends, man. I, I can't call it. It's too many variables. But I will I will say this, though, the last thing, though, because I don't, I don't, I spent too much time around white folks, and I know you live in an area around white folks, too. And and so this is not to dismiss anybody else's experience. But again, I can only draw upon my own life experience. I do not yeah. believe white people are afraid of us as a group or even as individuals. Because when white people fear you, they leave you the hell alone. When I first moved back here to uh, where I live now in North Carolina, I was in junior high. Got into it with this white boy. We got in the fight. It really turned into a wrestling match. Then about a month later, this big fat white boy, the center of the football team, just started picking on me in class. And so I get up, and he gets up, and he charges at me, and I beat him down so bad it ain't even funny. I had I took mercy on him because he was, he was on his knees taking a pounding. These white folks, I never had an issue with any of these white boys or any white person from junior high all the way to high school because I had a reputation that I wasn't the one to mess with. So when they fear you, they don't mess with you. They mess with you because they want you to be in fear of them. That's just my opinion. Yo, I, I, I do not I do not doubt anything what you say. As a matter of fact, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, the the way the way that I came up, the way that I used to be, the way that I'm trying to change from now, those exact reasons uh, is why I don't have to deal with some of the stuff I hear some of the other people, uh, some of the other victims have to deal with. Because like you, I had done built that reputation, uh, not only with white people, but with melanated people as well. You know, uh, certain things you just can't do. We, we didn't allow how I came up. You know, you, you answered certain stuff in, 
with certain type of situations. So when you do that, your name don't just get around your neighborhood. It goes around the city. And depending on what you've done, it goes around the surrounding areas also. So, and, and my mom, man, man, my mama used to always tell me, son, you cannot do this because if people are afraid of you, they will kill you. Man, she still tells me that right to the day. When I tell her about some of the stuff, I'm like, Mom, I'm, I'm bugging out. Like, I really need to. Somebody said this. Somebody said that. Somebody done this. Somebody done that. She was like, son, you you have five children. You really letting that bother you? You you really willing to go to prison over that? She's like, come on. You tell me about all of this stuff, how to fix my health and all, and, and you going to go get put away for that? So I understand exactly what you're saying. I understand exactly what you're saying wholeheartedly. But what you said actually goes to the point that I was making, though. When they fear you, they leave you alone. And the people who catch those bodies that they know have killed folks before, that they've seen shooting back before they leave them alone not to the point to where they won't take them to jail but they're not going to put themselves in a position to where they could catch one of them bullets and be added on to that list of names that he has attached to himself and he ends up going to jail instead of going to the morgue so what you said it fits right along exactly to what I was saying but brother Ross uh, go ahead on with the. Uh, we got a few more uh, articles we wanted to get to before we get to this. Uh, before we take this mask off, per se. Yeah, just if you a will, couple. Sir. Um, this one is actually really something to give people food for thought about what these uh, these colonizers do with their time. And Neely Fuller always says that uh, you know a white person will, will get a grain of sand from the bottom of the ocean and study it if they could figure out how to dominate us. So this one is just really mind-blowing, and I've, I've talked about this briefly and posted a few articles on this briefly, like last, I believe, but end of last summer. But this one is from Inverse.com, and it's human mini brains growing inside rat bodies are starting to integrate. We're entering totally new ground here. Stem cell technology has advanced so much that scientists can grow miniature versions of human brains called organoids or many brains if you want to be cute about it in the lab. But medical ethicists are concerned about recent developments in this field involving the growth of these tiny brains in other animals. Those concerns are bound to become more serious after the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience starting November 11th in Washington, D.C., where two teams of scientists plan to present previously unpublished research on the expected interaction between human mini brains and their rat and mouse hosts. In the newspaper, according to Stat, excuse me, scientists will report on the or, or, report that the organoids survive for extended periods of time, two months in one case, and even connected to lab animals, circulatory and nervous systems, transferring blood and nerve signals between the host animal and the implanted human cells. This is an unprecedented ad, ad, advancement, excuse me, for mini brain research. "Quote: We are entering totally new ground here." Unquote. Christoph Koch, a president. I mean, excuse me, the president of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle told Stat, quote, the science is advancing so rapidly, listen to this, the ethics can't keep up, unquote. Min that many brains can even be grown in the lab is a huge advancement in the first place as they have many of the same characteristics as living human brains that are in the early stages of development. Though they are not, quote, unquote, alive in the same sense that you and I are, they grow and are organized into different layers like our brains are. They even react in similar ways to stimuli like psychedelic drugs. Organoids are poised to revolutionize research on the human brain since scientists can perform these tests on them that would be unethical to attempt on living humans. Scientists have debated whether these brains are quote unquote conscious, but the fact that they could successfully they could be successfully implanted in lab animals raises a whole new set of ethical concerns. 
for the researchers who work with them. One of the major concerns in the mini brain scenario is that these organoids could grow to more advanced levels within lab animals, making the debate about mini brain consciousness much more urgent. That's the end. So you have mice and rats that basically have a, a cerebrum. And <laughs> these people are implanting human stem cells that turn into basically cerebrum tissue into these rats. Now, you know that white scientists have a, a notorious habit for releasing these animals into the wild. They've done it with mosquitoes. They've done it with all kinds of animals. Um, if you read up on the, the Montauk project, that was uh, something where they used to do all kind of wild experiments. I believe it was like the CIA and whatnot, and some of those scientists that they gave asylum from Germany after the war, but they had a, a facility on Montauk, um, Long Island, where they were doing the same thing, and the local people would talk about seeing what they call cryptids, which are these animals that don't belong to any of the uh, family of documented uh, fauna on the planet. They're animals that people had never seen before, and they also talked about them looking like basically these renegade mixtures of different animals all combined into one. So um, this is just a whole other thing. So you might, and I'm, I could see them releasing them into the wild, and next thing you know, you literally have a, a mouse or a rat in your house that can outthink you. And every trap that you try to set for it, it will never work. Um, and who's to say the, the rats won't learn how to hold guns too? Next thing you know, they're holding the twenty five at you. you. I mean, they got brains now. So this is really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think about that, Jenna? Yeah, oh, man. It, this goes right to uh, the fantastic voyage, living long enough to live forever, man. And we really got to uh, finish, finish that, that up yeah. and continue with this book study club that we had started way back before all of this other stuff started happening my grandmother and so on and so forth but we really got to get back to that uh, oh yeah these, these experiments that they're putting on it's just like what you were saying with the cloning you know they're, they're trying any and everything because that the time has come and that's why we have so much uh I mean, just look at the weather right now. You know, it's springtime, and we're experiencing winter, summer, spring, and fall all within the same week. They're, they're measuring these things out, and they're testing it on the people. Now, I could be wrong. I, I could be wrong. It has happened many times before. But this is what I'm saying. Uh, all of these tests, are being put forth so that they could get more uh, proficient in in trying to turn this into an atmosphere that they could survive in. Now well, there's their Can I chime in real quick? Just for something yeah. really, really brief. There was a, a little article from USA Today that I posted too that says uh, woolly mammoths may be the answer to saving the Arctic. And it says, just in the blurb, like something out of Jurassic Park, Harvard University scientists are planning to clone woolly mammoths using DNA from a preserved mammoth that is over 40,000 years old. So they're planning to bring, bring back the woolly mammoth. Yeah, but see, that's what they're saying, though. But, mm -hmm. but just like in the movie, it's never what they just say. Exactly. You know, they they bringing out the <laughs> woolly mammoth to the public but they got the saber tooth, you know what I'm saying, just waiting to be uncaged, you know. Yeah. Uh, you you had also put into the articles about uh, about splitting, not splitting, but uh, releasing the electrons from the atom, you know. Yeah. And like I said, uh, like I rebuttal to you, and I'm going to get to this, this sidebar over here. I see y'all having this conversation. I, I really won't, because... Uh, you know, Chris, you know how to get in here. Uh, hit star, star. And matter of fact, real quick, before I do any of that, uh, and I apologize, I normally do this uh, several times a night, but I haven't done this yet. Uh, if you would like to get into this conversation, if you're listening via uh, tune in and you would like to call in, ask a question, or make a comment, by all means, join us. That number is 347 
866-510-5160. I'm here, man. Uh, I hear you. I hear you, brother Chris. Uh, let me let me do that again. 866-510-9025. That number again is 866-510-9025. And I and I seen y'all over there having that conversation. I was going to address that here in a few. But just to answer your question, Roz, uh I always my my first inclination every time I hear something like that is that it's a weapon. It's a weapon and a woolly mammoth is something that the children could be like, Oh, I seen that I seen that mm-hmm. in the book. That would be awesome. You know what I'm saying? That would be awesome to see that the long tusk, this big old elephant, you know, 'cause that's that's what we gonna that's what we oh, gonna yeah. liken it to. Yeah, it's Say a furry again. elephant. It's basically a furry elephant. Right, but right. It's way and then, bigger. you know, exactly. You, you get this big old elephant, these long tusks, just a massive animal. They're going to they gonna love it. They're going to love it. But mm-hmm. all in a while, you got this vicious uh, saber tooth that's just waiting to taste some blood. Yep. You know, I mean, the exact same thing that go on in the movie, even though all of the people who are doing these uh scientific projects they seen the movie they seen how it turned out but they believe that they could do something different you know yeah we seen what happened but it ain't gonna happen to us because we know better quote unquote you know mm-hmm. and then a whole bunch of people get massacred because of some idiotic idea mm-hmm. that they had but uh to the uh to the question brother chris uh would you go ahead on and ask that question because I know uh, Brother Scotty wanted to get into that, and we're getting right here close to this next break. So after this next break, we're gonna go ahead on and jump into this uh, into this future song. You know, we're gonna get into this mask off for these last thirty minutes. So go ahead, um, Brother Chris. Is that the question about about black? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Well, the the question. Is why do why does spilling black put us on a depressing and a defensive mindset? But white makes one feel all right. And now, the reason now, why. You, uh, uh, hold on, brother Chris, because uh, I, I wanna I wanna ask you this question before you answer, because uh, I know brother Scotty wanted to uh, jump into that real quick. Uh, now, is this a reference to the status? No. Okay. All right. I just wanted to ask that question. Go ahead, brother. It's not. It's not a reference to the status. It, it, it's a reference to the to the to the term. And the term when you when you take when you subscribe to something, you feel a certain way because of how it's treated. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just how it is. When you get mad and say, because I'm an African and they've been putting their head on my shoulders. When you get mad and you say, I've been oppressed because of my black people and because of my, because of, 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 of what they've done to us and how they kept us out. Or if you feel you African and, and you don't feel American or you don't feel, and the reason why you don't feel American is because you've been treated unfairly in America. If they right. woke up tomorrow and gave everybody a million dollars, would nobody be talking about racism? If they gave right. you everything that you expected to get or everything that you wanted, you you yeah, would not you even deserve. you wouldn't even be complaining about the names. You're complaining right. because you feel depressed on who you are identified by. Now, mm-hmm. and it, I, I, it ain't got nothing to do with status because I already know what's going to happen when I get stopped. And I already know what they're mm-hmm. going to check me when I go to jail. I don't yeah. care what I look like. they going to, these people going to check black. When exactly. I get locked up and I look at my mug shot and the lady asks me, well, damn, you shouldn't even be in here. And I'm looking at the race and I'm like, damn, y- y'all just going to tell me who I am? I mean, of course, nigga, you a slave. So mm-hmm. I mean, what you, yeah. you want me to do? 
So mm-hmm. even though I make bail, definitely that at that particular time, and they're going to never happen again because we all had that run in. We all get them run in. You know, some of us get it more times than others. Right? But yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> and and you know, hey, I don't had it too. I just didn't want to, you know, incriminate myself. But what I'm saying, don't do that. <laughs> what I'm saying, when I said that, I was just basically saying, when saying black, and I get it because you know, it's identification, but. I feel that it sometimes it calls does it cause depression? Does calling yourself black make you feel depressed and offensive? And this, and why it is called when someone identifies themselves as white, they feel all right. That's, well, no, I mean, no. I, that's what well, I'm I just saying. think that's the system. The way the system is designed, you know, the color hierarchy put the black person at the bottom. So, um, and that's just consistent. Even dealing with other, best. even dealing with other non-white melanated people, they also treat black people, some of them, like white people do. It's the same mentality because it's a it's a social construct. You know, you set up the society to function a certain way, so we function in dysfunction. That is that is what they yeah, call civilization. But, it's functional dysfunction. Go but ahead. you're functioning, you're functioning in dysfunction, dysfunction based on what you're identifying with and not finding nothing else to pull you up with. Because well, it's the not words... really that you're identifying with it. It's that the person that is in control of your reality has identified you as such and has codified a system of laws, a system of social constructs, a system right. of in every area of people activity where this social construct is the way things are. And then they are the ones who are identifying you as the other. And, and, you know, even when I wrote that essay about um, education, you know, I talk about that. You know, we're, we're social, social beings. So to be ostracized as an other is one of the worst forms of psychological torture you can give to a human being because of the right. fact that we're social beings. So um, yeah. w- when you're dealing with that and you are consistently for many, many generations, this is your lot in life and it's never a happy ending. <laughs> And, you know, everything that you have is systematically taken from you with no legal recourse, no social recourse, no recourse. It's just, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, even though they just stole your boots, too. Like, that's the right. type of hey, stuff we've been me, dealing let me, with. Let so. me add in to this, yo, because mm-hmm. uh, I really want to hear what Brother Scotty got to say. But before he gets in, you go ahead on and unmute yourself, Brother Scotty. Uh, before he gets in... I just want to use a term that was coined by the late, great Charlie Murphy. Highly functioning retards, man. Highly functioning retards. We we have been uh, subjected, brainwashed, and taught to look at ourselves in a certain way. But with all that being said, with, with all of that being said, they say that you're not fully an adult in your brain capacity wise until you're 25 years old oh, so great. after after we have grown up we have lived a little bit just a little bit some of us don't live a lot at 25 let me let me correct that because it's all about the experiences the places and the things that you that you've done that makes you a man, not necessarily the age, because you could be an old fool just as well as you could be a young fool. So let me make that clarification. But but brain capacity wise, 25 years old, you become an adult. After you reach that threshold, you're supposed to be able to take all of your experiences, understand why you went through those experiences and do something greater. Most of us are too sad to make those changes. We're too sad to make those changes. And what happens when we don't make those changes? We complain. And just to answer, brother, uh, and and I'm going to get to you because we we did have uh, brother Scotty, but just to answer brother Scotty's question, which was, does Black Talk Radio make people depressed? Hell no. 
No, not the name, not the programming, not none of that. We have no, been no, introduced. It well, I would just answer my brother Scott's question. We have been introduced to a particular concept, and people have questions about that. That's why you started the. Uh, that's why you started the network. That's why you started BTR Community. This is the place that we hold those conversations. So no, they they it doesn't it doesn't depress people. A lot of people was depressed when they found you, brother Scotty. I agree. And they just they just now having a, a place and a voice to mention it. So uh, let me get uh, let me get brother Scotty in here before we get to this uh, this last break because we're gonna get into this mask off and yeah, I want to touch on something. The whole hey, the whole after night. Scotty's done. Just right. just real, real quick though, Black Talk Radio has made me embrace. That's and Facts. this is Chris talking. It has yes, made sir. me embrace, and I just wanted to say that. And when I talk about this, it's not to it's not to demeanor this network or to demeanor that. Basically, and what I'll say this, uh, Scotty basically identifies with black like we all do, but at the same time. He brought another. He he brought it black in a different direction. Black has not been brought in this direction. That's why I came with that position because most people that identify with black are are depressed. They are put down. They're not getting nowhere. They don't have no life, and they don't. They can't find nothing else. So I don't feel that way about myself. But I definitely Black Talk Radio has basically in, in it, ha, has brought black to life. Mm. It, it, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, brother Chris. And and what I posted in there wasn't to to question anything that you said, but let me, let me just frame it like this. I thought when I created Black Talk Radio Network that everybody, everybody that looked like me, considered themselves either black or African American, or they used the term interchangeably. It wasn't until after I started this network and then came into contact with these different viewpoints that there are people that I would classify as black that don't want to be labeled that. So, you know, my best friend from high school, he's a moor now. He's He's been locked up in prison, and that's how he came into contact with, with that, that, um, ideology and he calls himself a more now um mm-hmm. and i and, and so i you know i respect that i always respect people's self-determination i call Absolutely. you what you want me to call you you know what i'm saying because it's a sign of, of respect but for me black has always been a point of pride because you have to realize i came up in the 70s when there was strong expressions of black pride, the Afro and the Daishiki and the, the Black Panther Party and James Brown, I'm black and I'm proud. So I was raised that black, being black was something to be proud of. And while I never had a, a, a problem with that, that, that label or that, that classification as black. Now, as an adult, um, as a person who has been exposed to more, now I see how black fits into the racist system. You see what I'm saying, and how they and why. I'm and glad, I'm yeah, glad you said that, Scott. Go ahead. Up my apologies. Yeah, but I don't have to subscribe to their system. You know what I'm saying? I know what it means in their system, but I was calling myself black since a child as a point of pride. Because I was raised in a household and in a culture with the music and uh, everything. Well, be proud of who you are. Be proud. Be black and proud. Black don't mean bad. White don't mean good. That's the that's the oppressor's definitions. You know what I'm saying? Well, we don't subscribe oh. to that definition. So, you know, when I started Black Talk Radio, I was thinking of it as a way to signal to people who look like me that this is a safe space. And I mean people all over the globe because you got people in Africa like Stevie Biko who who, who used that label 
that classification mm -hmm. as as a unifying label among all people, melanated people with afros who look alike. You know what I'm saying? So that, I just alike. wanted to say that. But I understand now a lot better why some people reject that classification. And let, let me say this, because I always like to, when I'm wrong about something or I, you know, come into better understanding. Now, there has been times I butted heads with people who say that we indigenous, although I don't think anybody's indigenous except for those in Africa. We're aborigines. That means the first people, you know, some of the oldest people on the land. And, and, and so, so we, I, I am, I do know my Catawba Indian roots and I know my um, Cherokee roots. And it was only recently in the past couple of days and talking to one of my elder cousins who's trying to get the land and get the land back that they stole. And we, you know, done some research together. And we were talking about the census where one of our ancestors was listed as a mulatto. All their children was listed as mulatto and his wife was listed as black. And he said, he said she wasn't black. She was Catawba. She was just dark skinned. And so they just called her black. So I do understand where people come are coming from when they say that if we are aborigine or have aborigine roots, it may be tied to some land like, you know, my roots are tied to this land, but that's not the case with all of us. So, you know, I'm whatever people want to classify if somebody tell me, look, I'm I'm not a black man. I'm I'm this, I'm that. The other. As a show of respect, whenever I'm conversating with them, I refer to them by what they want me to refer to them by. Yeah. yeah. With that being said, we're going to cut right to this next break. And uh, thank y'all for tuning in and checking us out here on Real Talk, the radio show uh, brought to you by Foundational Radio Network on Black Talk Radio Network. If you have a question or comment you want to add to this conversation, by all means, give us a call. That number is 866-510-9025. That number again is 866-510-9025. Press star star to make yourself known and we'll get with you as soon as possible and we will be right back after this quick commercial break no I'm not a writer okay Black Talk Radio since 2008 providing new black media for the masses Not a woo tango. Now just throw that in there anyway. <laughs> Yo, now, this has been a great. Uh, go ahead, brother Ross. Go ahead. Oh no, nah, I just wanted to just um just you know just say a couple of things about that, and I'm glad to hear Scott Scotty discuss this from this um this angle too. Um, you know, when I learned about black, I learned about it in the context of, um, you know, our ancestors in the now. And Dr. Wilson talks about that all the time, that um, uh, Asar was known as the Lord of the Perfect Black. You know, um, you could also say the same is about um, Amun, who became known as Amun Ra. So that was always my position on understanding the the spiritual impact of what calling oneself black really meant um, and that was one of the main contexts that I embraced um, in regards to that on top of everything Scotty elucidated on as far as just you know uh, many of our freedom fighters were referring to themselves as black and, um, and when he talked about the global context it makes perfect sense because many people around the planet refer to themselves as black um culturally speaking it is just and especially with um with the advent of hip-hop hip-hop is everywhere so 
that that's part of what's being pushed. That concept is being pushed with the music. So it just makes sense. It's just it just it's just the way that you know, not only does the colonizer refer to us as that, but we also refer to ourselves as that. And that's um, something uh, that we understood as far as just the impact of what being black is as far as the, um, the original state of the universe and the original state of uh, the creator's uh, being, those humans that, that, that he, she created, that they're all created. Um, they, were, they were dark and heavily melanated first. And, um, you know, that's just pretty much what I've always understood it to be. And also, I understand what it, what, um, what he was talking about as far as the legal aspect of black and why some people do not identify themselves that way. And I've made that clear previously. But also, in reference to what we were talking about before we get into the, um, the math, I just wanted to just, just read something. I had used part of this in an essay that I wrote, um, but I just think it's really... Uh, apropos to what we're talking about so it's um, it's quite telling just about psychology so it says um, this is from Negroes and other essays by one of my favorite authors um, Umulimu Barusi he's a gender of mine as well so he says with that in mind this is from page 37 with that in mind think about this if European culture is insanity then at the fundamental level that humans define and perceive reality we as Africans and people of color have a very serious problem if a cultural minority becomes the power majority and this minority through military media and religious might force the majority cultures to adopt its culture as their own, then insanity becomes the norm and it is redefined as sanity. Accepting another's reality as yours makes their reality yours. Now, further down, he says, unfortunately, as is the case with the European cultural imperialism, if the insane can, can convince the same that insanity is sanity, then the same majority become insane, and insanity becomes universal and comes to be seen as sanity. Those individuals or groups who dare to hold on to their original sanity become universally depicted as truly insane or backwards, and those who are the carriers of the original insanity become universally depicted as truly sane or modern. Indeed, the Europeans are a minority. They currently represent less than 10% of the world's population, and their numbers are steadily shrinking to an estimated 3% by the year 2073. So, I think that that just speaks to that concept of black being depressing, that concept of white being wonderful. Um, that's how we have been conditioned. The insanity has been spread so far and wide that it is now seen as sanity. And those of us, like the people who listen to Black Talk Radio Network, that preserve the original sanity are seen as insane and backwards, while those who have embraced what we know is the original insanity are considered modern. So Yo, that's what I wanted to uh, drop on that. Or, Go ahead. Or, or civilized. You know, you can't yeah, leave that part out. Absolutely. <laughs> Yo, but, but continuing on, man, to, to my favorite part of the conversation, I know we done, uh, we done dropped 10 minutes, but it's all good. Just this smaller tidbit is going to be so devastating. Uh, when we're talking about what masks do you wear, for those of you who own businesses, uh, work a nine-to-five, or you hustle, some of us put on masks every day we work up, we work out, every day we wake up, excuse me. And some of us don't. Some of us are the same person that we are 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Some of us are only half of ourselves for that same time period. Now, which one are you? Are you the person that puts on a mask depending on who you're speaking to? Or are you the person that is the same person no matter who you run into and no matter who you deal with? Me, myself, I have uh, come to find that I am the same uh, aggravating, hard to get along with, hard to understand person no matter who I'm dealing with 
children, wife, mother, brother, sisters, uh, and other family members, along with friends. The difference between is that the friends understand who I am and they are okay with it. My sisters, brothers, mothers, and other family members cannot get away from me, even if they wanted to. Now, we don't have to speak, but they're still my blood relatives. So, which one are you? And we have a few different uh, articles to read about this, because I know some of you go to work every day the same way that I do. And you treat people a different way because for whatever reason, you need your job, uh, you have to pay your bills, you might like some of the people more than you like the people that you see at home, whatever the case may be, but you put a mask on. So do you have that uh, that article queued up, Brother Ross? Uh Yes, I do have uh, one of them here, yeah, the one from Psychology Today. It says... Yeah. um. Go ahead. Hit us off with that, please. Sure. It's um the mask that we wear, imposter syndrome, and why it sometimes feels uh sometimes excuse me, and why we sometimes feel like a fake. Brothers hey, and sisters, can you read that? Can you read, read that headline with a little bit emphasis on the imposter part, please? Sure. <laughs> uh, it's the mask that we wear, imposter syndrome. And why we sometimes feel like a fake. Brothers and sisters, it's that time of year, the season when Halloween pop-up stores appear on every corner. Popular, um, popular costumes range from princesses and the princesses and Frozen to Donald Trump and zombies, which are, I believe, the same outfit. People go nuts about Halloween. That made me start thinking about the psychology behind the celebration. Halloween is actually an ancient Celtic holiday on which people believed they needed masks to protect themselves from bad spirits that roam the earth on all Hallow's Eve. Thousands of years later, people are still wearing masks. They hide behind everything from a false smile to Dr. Dre headphones to my personal favorite, people who wear dark glasses in the subway, and these people aren't celebrities. Then there are the emotional masks, the masks we hide behind because of fear. For example, if we are insecure, we might hide behind the mask of name dropping. If we are unsure of our power, we can hide behind the mask of being a bully. If we don't think the world loves us, then we can hide behind the mask of anger. We mask the debt we have incurred to pay for lifestyles we can't afford. We pretend things are fine at work when our jobs are on the line. We pretend things are okay in our marriages when there is distance. What mask do you wear? One of the most common reasons we wear masks is what I think of as imposter syndrome, the fear that the world is going to find us out. I've heard it described as feeling like a fake. You don't really... Excuse me, like you don't really belong or like you aren't really successful but are just posing as such. It's like my Halloween costume at age seven. I dressed up as a zombie gypsy, something I believed to be terribly scary until my next door neighbor yanked off my mask and said, oh, it's just you. One of our greatest fears is that we show our true selves. The world will say, oh, it's just you. But being just you is actually the best and most perfect thing you could ever be. As I for a while said, quote, be yourself, everyone else is taken, unquote. Or if you are interested in the spiritual perspective, the psalmist wrote, quote, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, unquote. There are three practical reasons why we should shut our masks. The first is to live into our potential. We have to bring all of who we are and what we do to what we do, excuse me. There are numerous people who have our same skill sets or maybe an even better one. But none of these people bring the same personality, creativity, and spirit to the job that you do. That's something they can't match. The irony is that we often mask that part of ourselves at work and lose our greatest potential. The second reason is belief. It's exhausting to live an inauthentic life. You put on a mask or two or ten and then take a few off, then put a couple more on. It's exhausting. Worst of all, you start forgetting who you really are. As comedian and actress Fanny Bryce explained, quote, let the world know you as you are, not as you think you should be, because sooner or later, if you are posing, you will forget the pose, and then where are you? Unquote. The third reason is healing. When we wear masks, we carve a piece of ourselves out. Withholding part of ourselves is unworthy. But in relationships, especially in, spirit, in our spiritual relationships, we can't be truly healed unless we offer up all the pieces. It's like handing someone a broken vase and asking him or her to fix it, but holding back two or three of the broken pieces. 
as one of the pastors of Hope City Church in Indianapolis, Indiana explained, quote, Mass makes shallow what God has intended to be deep. Everything in our lives get cheated when we choose to hide ourselves behind our masks, unquote. We weren't born with masks. We put them on. And so we can take them off. Start with this simple exercise. Think about a negative message that you've held on to. Ask yourself whether it's true. More than likely, the answer is no. And if it is not, then you have to ask these questions. Why am I carrying that message? If I put it down, what would happen? Probably nothing. The main risk we face is the world's reaction. Opening yourself up threatens others. It invites them to reevaluate their own lives. Many times it forces them to realize that they too have the power to change but haven't. Don't let that stop you. Don't pull your mask partially off and let the world scare you into pulling it back on. As the poet E.E. E. Cummings wrote, quote, the greatest battle we face as human beings is the battle to protect our true selves from the self the world wants us to become, unquote. Think about the mask you wear and commit to taking them off. Hold your gifts out to the world. No apology, no shame, no regret. As the old saying goes, every creature has its rightful place, and in that place, it becomes beautiful. That's the end. So, I'm blaming um, you, Rasta man. I'm blaming you. You <laughs> were supposed to do this at the top of the hour, and we got ten minutes left. I'm blaming you. <laughs> okay. To go ahead, yo. That right there, man. That was a that was a dope article, and for, there are several other articles uh, about the same thing. Not the same article, but but similar Different to these masks. The same thing. And, yes, to these masks that we put on, uh, and and this is not just at work. This is also here at BTR community. Uh, it's on Facebook. It's on Twitter. It's on what is it? What's the other ones? Tinder, uh, mm-hmm. Snapchat. Uh, I'm 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 not a party to all of those. I'm I'm on Twitter, but uh, Twitter and Facebook and BTI is all I'm on. But there are several social media programs to where people put on a mask, pretend to be somebody that they're not, and then they get upset when people are disappointed when they run into them in real life. You know, they've been pretending for so long they start to be they start to believe that they're pretending to be themselves because they're really who they pretend to be. And these things get in the way of our evolution. You can't even be a real person no more because everybody wants to live that life of a uh let's say a thug or or a baller, you know. And they and they say things because of stuff that they heard, whether it be on a rap song or, or one of their friends may have done something that they wish they could have done when neither one of them had no business doing it in the first place. But they wanted to be that person, but they was too afraid to do that in actuality. So you run into these people, uh one of the one of my favorite quotes from one of the most dangerous people that I know, my uncle. Now he's he's been in prison a few times. Little bitty dude, smaller than me, built built like a statue. I mean, like like this dude looked like he was he was chiseled out of some, out of a rock or something. And he told me, he said, Jerry. The loudest people in the room are the scariest people in the room. He says, so don't find yourself arguing with people. Because if you do, then you fall into the circle or the trap that they done set. So one of the things that I try to do, especially on social media, is I try not to argue with, with other black people. And, and I have been guilty of falling into that trap, but I try to be respectful if I do get pulled into that trap, no matter how disrespectful they get with me. The reason I do that is because more times than not, those people are going through a lot more stressful time than I am. And 
with me not wearing a mask, I would I could jump into his or her butt the same way I could jump into this white woman's or this white man's butt. The only difference is that I see that white man or that white woman first. So when we start thinking like this, I know all of us done heard the term uh, somebody always has it worse than you do. And it makes a whole lot more sense when you hear these particular people talk, not on social media, but in mm-hmm. person or over the phone. You get to see, well, you get to hear, rather, the type of environment that they have to deal with, the type of stress that they have to deal with. So sometimes the best way to show black self-respect is to allow that other black person to release that anger on you. Yeah, you may not be with that. You might actually do something very seriously uh, damaging to that person. I've been in that situation and I wanted to do some very serious damage to a few people not just one I've actually done that and you know what it got me (laughs) it got me a shadow that will follow me for the rest of my life and that's not a good feeling so think of it in this manner and I'm just trying to close it up real quick because I know we have a we got to get this prayer before we close out the night because I had so much more I wanted to speak on. But but think about every time one of your sisters or brothers that you don't even know. Excuse me, hey, end. Jenna, I posted in the chat, man. If y'all need some extra time, take it. Oh, thank oh, you. Oh, no worries. No worries at all. Thank you, Brother Scotty. You know, I was just trying to work on your time because you're doing us a favor tonight. So Absolutely. You know that. Thank you. But yeah. uh, what I what I was saying is, is that uh, you might be doing them a favor, letting them blow off some steam, because we all need that. Brother Scotty created this network for us to be able to talk with each other freely. Everybody you run across ain't going to be able to articulate themselves to the point to where they could just have a chat. I, I revert to my lower self, I can't, like I said, I have a shadow. I have a shadow that's cast over the rest of my years that I, that the most have sees fit for me to live on this earth. I have a shadow cast upon me because of the things that I didn't, because I didn't do what I'm saying right now. Somebody would get out of pocket with me and I would handle that didn't care about going to jail, didn't care how bad I hurt that particular person. Well, I'd done it a few times too many, and I was told to come in here for this again. I, You know, the judge told me, I dare you to come in here for hurting somebody else. Sometimes, I mean, some of y'all are a lot smarter than me. Some of y'all are a lot smarter than me. And y'all can hear what I'm saying in the sincerity in my voice. And you could be like, you know what? That brother right. Because is it really worth that? We out here trying to uh, pass along information that my whole purpose for starting this radio show was to pass along information that I didn't know while I was coming up. I passed this along to my children. I could bring... Of course, they're asleep now because they have to be in bed. They got school, but I could bring my son or my daughter down here. And they could talk with you the same way that I'm talking with you because these are the conversations that we hold already. I've been teaching them in elementary school to to understand what they see from these little mini race soldiers and also to see from our more confused brothers and sisters' children also because they don't have to just worry about one. They have to worry about them both. And what I find is that they end up educating 
the little young brothers and sisters, and then their parents come and hunt me down during parent teacher conference because they want to figure out, they're trying to figure out how do they know about this? You know what I'm saying? I wasn't made aware of this no time uh, when I was younger. I had to go look this up because my child came and told me about it. So that's what we do this for. Sometimes somebody has to let off some steam. You might get the unfortunate position of being the person that they release it on. It happens like that. I'm pretty sure it's been times that you have had to let some steam off on somebody that you probably cared about and they just listened to you. How about we start extending that courtesy? I'm not saying get mistreated. Nobody wants that. I mean, let's be serious. Nobody wants to be disrespected. But when somebody's saying some uh, felonious stuff, let sometimes it's best just to let them get that off of their chest. You don't know that could have saved them. Because it's apparent that they wasn't letting it off anywhere else. And sometimes that's what that's all we need to be. It's just the ear. But uh, was that you, Brother Ross, or was that Brother Chris? That was me. All right. Go ahead, Brother Chris. Um, One thing I was saying, or what I was thinking about when you was talking was about the mask, a certain mask that people put on. I noticed with myself, I adjust to people who, you know, they come in, a woman might look a certain way where, you know, you know, she might be overweight or whatever, and I always greet them. They come in looking mad. They come in looking at you as if it's a, it's an attack, and I sense that from a lot of my people. Right. And I try to, I try to, I say, do you realize sometimes I say hello, and they won't say nothing. How are you doing? Hey, hello, how are you doing? And they won't say nothing. And then they'll get closer to the desk and they'll sit down and then I'll just say it again. Oh, I'm doing fine. And I know they heard me when they walked in the door, but sometimes our people are not used to being greeted. And that's what I picked up on, like, wow. You know, and what I also noticed is cause I got to put on all kind of different with people who walk in. I treat everybody the same. But, you know, you got other cultures, you can tell they look out for their own people, even if they, they might have a, a same skin tone. If you ain't Muslim, they ain't rolling with you. If you ain't from a certain continent, they going to come in and get a, you know, a quote and do business and this, this and that. But, you know. That's as far they, as it go. Yeah, that's as far as it go. And so this is when, this is why I always, you know, try to get into how we really need to understand where we at and how we need to connect. And, you know, we need to take the word, I guess what I'm coming to, We the word black is really like a nickname. You know what I'm saying? It's like a nickname. Somebody call you something, you know. But it's, 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 it's and the thing with our people, and I'll, and I'll jump on that real quick and I'll leave it alone, but a lot of us don't know what, they they can't go past black, you know. Like Scotty, he can he can talk about certain things in his. He knows certain parts of his people, just like I know certain Hold parts on, of my people. Chris. Hold on, and I, Chris. And 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 I'm just gonna hit this point real quick. And I tell brother, uh, I tell brother Rise this, and I've told brother Scotty this uh, in private also. It's it's very different when you know something that everybody else wants to know. Not necessarily about anything particular, but just about yourself. Uh, Ross come from a background to where his past was shared with him verbally and physically. Brother Scotty, the same thing. Those are two rare brothers. Most of us have to go out there and search it. So we are so desperate in this time and age, we are looking for something to gravitate towards. So we gravitate to the closest thing that we that we think we can make sense out of. So 
so when you do this, you have people in all different all different walks of life reaching for all different sorts of things, no matter what they look like. Everybody that, that that's going to gravitate over to what you're on, not going to necessarily look like you. The reason y'all are in the same circle at that particular time is because y'all are searching for the same thing. Go ahead, Brother Chris. My apologies. Oh, you good, brother. And, and you know, black black is black is what's going to bring us together but it's not enough for people who can't go past the word black i can go past the word black i'm finding relatives in the early 1800s and then i'm finding you know with my grandmother she was a blackfoot and then somebody else was a seminole and all this other stuff but some people can't do everybody can't do that and some folks they get stuck just on that word and they and they operate based on how that word is operated in today's system. And you know, I can hear Roz, I can hear Scotty, I can hear Dave, I can hear you know, you 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 know we we all know, you know, it's it, it's we we brothers. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, there's a lot of people that can't go past that and that's what I run across. I run a lot of confusion. And, and and they're acting in the way of negativity, and that's a mask, just like what you was breaking down. We we, we put on masks, you know. And fortunately, you know, I'm in a position. We in a position to where, because I've I've spoken to you off the record, and I've I've heard how you associated yourself around people. You didn't you didn't get high pitch, but hey, how you doing? I didn't hear you change your tone. You sound the same. <laughs> You sound the same way when we were talking from whoever you talked to. And, you know, some brothers you see, they, they what? And did somebody grab his neck? I don't know what, he, you know, but. but <laughs> yeah, them, them oxen start to go up a little ways, Wait. you know. And you know what's what crazy you? is that ties into when you talk about people who can't get past black. It, it ties into, you know, the insanity becoming and being considered sane. You know, we should be able to get past anyone's label to be able to work with them. That's something that Minister Malcolm talked about emphatically once he, you know, made his hodge and, and really got a wider perspective. That's why, you know, and I've even heard people talk against traveling. Travel is one of the greatest things you can do. It, it expands yeah. your consciousness. You can't, you, you, can't, you can't keep the same localized, uninformed mentality when you've been someplace else and act, not just been there let's say on vacation and let's say if you're just like a young person you're there and you're not really really paying attention to your surroundings you're there because you're going there for the beach or for whatever amenities I'm talking about going someplace and immersing yourself in that other country experiencing the local culture and talking to the people and all of that type of stuff then you start to gain perspective you know um, and and that's, that's why I have a different perspective on my understanding of the global black community. That's why I have the understanding of our people. Wherever I am is home. You know, Peter Todd said it before I was born. I'm a global citizen. Anywhere I touch down is where I'm from because my people were there first. And if I go somewhere and I see somebody who looked like me, they're just my cousin. That's how I think about it. And, you know, functioning as a counter-racist, if the person is standoffish, then VGQ. It's all good. Go do you, you know? And, but for, for me, I've met many, many black people around the world from different places around the world, and they see black people here as kinfolk. When I went to Kemet in 2007, and we went to Nubia, they called us Nubian Americans, all of us. They didn't call us African Americans. They called us Nubian Americans. They instantly made a connection between themselves and us and they knew that we were coming there on a pilgrimage to the place that was the most holy place on earth before the colonizers created their traditions off of our traditions as far as their so-called religion so they understood the reverence and respect with which we were coming to see them and they in turn said hey you know let this we're gonna we're gonna make that connection instantaneously you're one of us and it doesn't mean that all of them feel that way, 
because a lot of them are infected with white supremacy like all of us are and it expresses itself in that kind of acute self self hatred right. and that's just a, that's just a normal thing we have to understand that that's a part of our journey here the idea is, is are you going to let that one person or those few people that you might have come across like that paint your visit your view on an entire group of people that look like you really well to me that just doesn't make sense regardless of what your situation is we all are under the same tyranny from the same criminals and you know if you read the destruction of black civilization he interviewed over 100 people from 120 different tribes from all over the continent it was him and a group of students that were researching with him as he was making the book and they said we understood he said all of them said they understood they came from a common background and that they were basically brothers and sisters that were removed by time and space based on where each group migrated. So in ancient times, they never killed each other. And he goes to outline the fact that they had nonviolent forms of solving conflict. If you ever saw the show on Shaka Zulu, they say that when, they, when, when, when uh, Shaka first sees Dingus Whale go to war, and everybody's putting on their war mask and they're trying to scare each other. Nobody's making any physical contact at all. They're just making um, gestures. And, and he was like, hey, we got to prepare. You know, these white people are coming and these people want to do the show and dance. We got to learn how to kill. And Shaka introduced the concept of killing because he, he had visions of what white people were going to bring to the continent to where they were before it happened. So the whole thing is, when you really read and you understand that we understood that we were connected, then you can never sit there and say that anything that has to do with being Pan-African came from white people, because these are traditional black Africans on the continent saying we had these connections and we treated each other with a high level of respect because we understood those connections. And once these invaders came in, when we were vulnerable to those invaders, based on the deterioration of our culture from within first, that we were right for the picket. That's pretty much what happened. So it's just getting perspective and understanding about the way things really were. And it doesn't mean Africa was a utopia. They, they had disagreements, but they weren't violent disagreements. And that's documented in that text. So all you have to do is just read the book from the people who did the empirical research and you'll come out with a totally different understanding on what we were once like and why in ancient times we were described as the most righteous, the most religious, the most pious people. We never stole. There was no concept of rape. There was no such thing as an orphanage. There was no such thing as a jail. That's what civilization is, where you don't even know what a jail is because people never did anything to have to go to jail because you had a holistic society. It wasn't a perfect society, but it was holistic. And as a result, there was no such thing as homelessness. There was no such thing as prostitution. That's white people's stuff. That's not our stuff. They, they turned us into prostitutes, just like they turned us into slaves. We just have to come to really get that understanding. And then it'll just broaden your scope. And if you get a chance to travel, travel. But travel not just for the fun of it, but make it a research trip. Ask people questions. Get, get down with the locals and find out what you can find out about the history of that place. And you'll come across some incredible information, you know, that you can take with you. And instead of having a narrow-minded perspective, you can broaden your scope. And it'll, it'll really help make you a, a more whole person. Because, you know, hey, we're, taught, we're taught to be xenophobic. Go ahead. Let's, let's, let's make sure that, that uh, let's make sure when we tell them that, because I, I have traveled. And, yes, you have. You know, recognize the times. You mm -hmm. can become a potential. Uh, a participant an unwanted participant in slavery especially right. during yeah. today's time so you be careful uh, I'm going to say this and then because we're going to we, I'm going to let you wrap it up and give us the prayer and, and we get on up out of here but I'm going to yes, say sir. this real quick I walked the streets of uh, I walked the streets of a few different uh, cities on a few different continents uh this one in particular was uh, I was in Italy and I walked into a, a straight up uh, to what would you call it it's not a pizzeria because that's not what they call them but it was a it was a Italian uh, it was a Italian barista I guess and it was me and a couple of the other sellers on my boat 
Me, another brother, two white dudes, and a, uh, a Asian guy. Yeah, I know that that, that sounds like a joke, don't it? But <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, though, uh, two brothers, two white dudes, and an Asian guy. We walk into this little Italian barista. We walk in there. We see two. We see three. We see three mob dudes sitting at a table, no customers, and a butcher. The butcher in the back behind the counter, what have you. We walked in. Ain't nobody say nothing. Those four gentlemen looked at me. I don't know if they was looking at me or they was looking at everybody, but the way that I look at people, I look at people in the eyes, so it always looked like whoever looking my way is looking directly at me because I'm looking into their eyes. Mm -hmm. And I told them, I said, yeah, we got to get up out of here. The brother that was with me, he heard me say that. Me and him at the door first. The white dudes and the uh and the Asian guy. It was like, nah, we gonna we gonna try out those were like y'all can stay here if y'all want to. We finna go. They decided they was gonna leave because we was kinda frantic. I mean we wasn't, you know, hysterical or nothing, but we was we was very, very sure that we was not finna be uh kicking it in that place when we left now mind you this place is in the middle of nowhere now we get about I say about a hundred yards from the uh, from the door and all four of those gentlemen was outside watching us walk off it's like yeah y'all was finna get us murdered trying to trying to check out some local cuisine instead of going to the places where they told us because brother uh, Scotty can attest to you when you go certain places they give you a list of places you can go yep. and a list of places that you should not go and you know we young and dumb we always want to go to the places where we should not go man we almost didn't make it up out of there I just wanted to add that in with that travel tip because oh yeah, well I was gonna say I wouldn't recommend hurt. traveling now at <laughs> this time, but yeah, I just think you know in in times that are more peaceful, travel is actually a very good thing. It's a, it's a it's yes. a consciousness expanding thing. I don't think in yes, today's day and yes, time, I just posted the article where they stranded those people in Mexico. The airline just stopped going to Mexico overnight and left these people there. There's hundreds of people stranded there right now. You know, so I'm you know, so I wouldn't recommend traveling at this point. Just because too much is happening as far as war is concerned, but once things are, you know, to a, to a place where travel is safe, and you get the opportunity and you have the the funds to do it, I would just recommend it. it it'll be a, some life altering stuff, especially if you go to places that you're really interested in going to. It it's no joke. Um, but yeah, you're right about that, man. You gotta, you know, you 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 have to really watch things. I remember when we went to um to Abu Simbel, which is the the rock the temple that's cut out of the side of the mountain but dedicated to Ramses the Great. And um, when we went there, we actually had like a caravan of armed guards, you know, with machine guns because driving there, bandits were known to pull over busloads of armed tourists and rob them at, at gunpoint. You know, and they got the AK. That's what the, the average, you know, <laughs> extremist is holding down out there. So we literally had like a, a caravan of like armed guards that took us you know, safely from where we were to Abu Simbel, and then you know to leave that area, we had the same caravan to go back to where we needed to in order to continue our trip. So yeah, there's places you can go, and there's places you can't go. You are absolutely right about that. And um, you know, and sometimes you can get little gems. You know, if you meet somebody that's actually about something, and they they're willing to show you some things that you might not have you know known existed on in that particular part of the world. That's happened too. It all depends on. How things unfold, yeah. but you're right. You got to be careful. That's no question. <laughs> yeah, you could find somebody that could give you something that's not on the travel guide. You you are correct. But uh, go ahead on and take us on up out of here, brother. Rod. Yeah, so, thanks for being with us this evening. Thank you, Scotty, for the extra time as well, and thanks for um for you know holding us down tonight. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so we're gonna get ready to get up out of here. So we're gonna hit you with the prayer and then keep it rolling. 
Uh, Creator, we ask that you help us to remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us to remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times and all places, each and every time that we are in contact with another black person. Like Gus says, it has been time to replace white supremacy with justice ASAP, with kill slavery and human trafficking as well. And um, I am in the love of the all, and all love is in me. I am a part of the all, and the all is a part of me. I am one with the all, and the all is one with me. I can succeed as a part of the all and fail as an individual. I can be all that I wish in the all, as long as my wish is to stay in the all. I am never alone. The all is. I am. The all can, I can. The all does, I do. Thanks again for spending your Tuesday evening into the night with us on Real Life, the radio show with myself and my partner, Jenna Kepra. And um, thanks again, Scotty, as well. We're on our foundational radio network as well as BTR on Black Couple Radio Network, I should say. Thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Have a great evening. Peace and love. We'll see you next week. Yes, yes, Always most remember. definitely. Before we get out of here, I got one more real quick thing. I was listening to Brother Panic on YouTube today, and he said something very, very profound. And this goes right along with practicing black self-respect. We have two extremes. We have the left side of the extreme, and we have the right side. Let's try to be in the middle that way nothing can upset you with that being said keep on learning we love y'all see y'all next week peace thank you brother scott Lesson one, or to be learned, no. Fighting the loud props, gotta be earned. A lot of rappers nowadays are sound alike. So wanna be thugs, spitting garbage on the mic. Now I'm a golden age baby. Brooklyn, stand up. Back then fake rappers got no love and banged up. I resurrect beats like the walking dead. I'm like Rick slaying his track, like two to the head. Whether off the head or with the pad of a pen. Any MC in front of me is me in the end. No matter who I'm against, they're gonna regret. Ever battling me, cause my lyrics are lead. And the best thing nearly enough protection for the lyrical destruction I'm projecting I'm sending deadly heights in your direction I'm tech cause it's the explosive presence when it comes to hip hop at its core it's about original style original flow stay true to yourself and you never will fold and never let anyone deter you from your goals it's out of control the way these rappers sell their souls they don't care whether in public or behind closed doors son never get caught up in trends or fads you might make money for the moment but it never will last never lie to yourself and you won't mind the booth. Son, the booth is your confessional. Speak the truth. I get up on the mic and let my bowels loose. Like a bird overhead, I'm stealth bombing a fool. You know the rules. Brooklyn. Yeah. Originality overflows in me, and the truth is. That's what it is. Now I understand. What it is. What it is. Now I understand. Carry on tradition.